While C.S. Lewis was one of the best, if not the best, Christian writer of the last century, there are some areas where his theology was a little unorthodox. We explore a few of those areas of incongruency and seek to point you in the right direction as you consume his material. Welcome to the show that loves doubters. Here on Christianity Still Makes Sense, we look at topics that can cause us to deconstruct our Christian faith and cause doubt. Finding that a faith hero of ours has seemingly unorthodox theological views can throw us for a loop. C.S. Lewis is one of the greatest Christian writers of the 20th century, but as we will discuss today, he colored outside the lines. Professor of Christian Ethics at Southern Seminary, Kenneth Magnuson, said this, I am happy to have my students read one of the most important apologists of the 20th century. Lewis is not always right, but he is nearly always worth considering and engaging. Now, Bobby, before we get to some of the areas where he did color outside the lines, if people aren't familiar with Lewis, what would you say to them to persuade them to pick up one of his books? I think the vast amount of book sales alone should influence any Christian that wants to live in the arena of the thought life and to be sparked in their creativity is uh, a means of just appreciating, you know, what you know, God did through somebody with such a vast imagination. I mean, he's perhaps the most influential writer of the modern era and his writings are quoted so often. Our readers, uh, our readers of Lewis will be encouraged just seeing his quotes in the book. I can remember hearing so many quotes about C.S. Lewis. I mean, he's probably the most quoted Christian of all time, uh, at least from the modern era. And I loved when I started reading his books and I'd be, oh man, there's that quote I heard that pastor talk about. Lewis just has a knack for putting words to much of what we feel. He's colorful, humorous, insightful. He bleeds common sense. But I'll let his friend and colleague who was crucial in his conversion, J.R.R. Tolkien, answer your question, Tim. He once told a friend of Lewis you'll never get to the bottom of him. And I think Mm -hmm. that is so true. And that's J.R. Tolkien speaking. I mean, you'll never get to the bottom of Tolkien either. So very, uh, you know, informative uh, statement for us to chew on. If you can't get to the bottom of him, if you want want a writing companion that is colorful, engaging, uh, not boring, stimulating, challenging, uh, honest, authentic, Lewis can be a great reading friend to pick up. Well, and that's exactly right. And also, I would add to that, that it's for all ages. I mean, you know, my kids uh, who are, you know, uh, 8 and 12, I've loved Narnia. Uh, You know, my wife has read that to them. We've watched the movies. But I've also felt that I've been, you know, really, really benefited from Lewis's writings, you know, just his philosophical thought and clarity, just as you mentioned. But again, as we're going to talk about today, there was a friend of his named Charles Wilson who started out as an occultist. And this friend of Lewis's, uh, you know, had some influence on him and also Owen Barfield, whose daughter was the namesake of the character Lucy in the Narnia series, was also heavily into the occult. And uh, as we mentioned, we see witches and magic and uh, wizards and sorcery and much of Lewis's fictional writings. So what did Lewis believe? Believe about the relationship between the occult and, and, and those kind of, you know, that category of things and his Christian faith. Well, he was certainly familiar with it, you know, as you mentioned with Charles Williams and Owen Barfield, uh, you know, and some of the, you know, books that he would have read growing up. When you look at Lewis's life, uh, you know, growing up, he's somebody who's deeply influenced uh, by the life of the mind and he loves all things creative him and his brother uh warren whom he affectionately referred to as warney and lewis c.s lewis his nickname is jack uh you know so clive staples lewis Uh, but him and warney his brother they they just had these imaginary worlds that they created with his brother creating this world called india and lewis loved to draw like pictures of animals and he just had this mind that 
could go off the charts with you know the imagination but he was steeped in north norse mythology uh he was very familiar um with greek mythology uh he was very widely read and so he was totally informed on lots of the different mythic teachings that were out there uh, in his book surprised by joy that talks about his early conversion uh, you can learn about how he thought and, and, and how different books sh shaped him and his spiritual journey and so he is uh, by some accused of you know holding to those occult teachings uh, when they look at a book like the Narnia series. Uh, you know, what's going on there with some of the different characters? Some will say, oh, this is all influenced by the occult. Uh, but I'm not convinced of that. I think that, uh, sure, at a certain stage in his life, that was a real appeal to him, in particular in his younger years. But Lewis dabbled a lot. I mean, he was in search of truth. He went from, you know, going to church and having this a fantastic imagination, uh, kind of believing in the supernatural to not going to church, to slipping into atheism, then, you know, moving more toward, you know, agnosticism, then coming to theism and then actually coming to Christianity. Uh, you know, when he comes to theism, he says, you know, I'm the most reluctant convert in all of England. And so I think when you're looking at the Narnia series, uh, for, for us to try to derive, um, you know, what his beliefs were about the occult uh, would be to miss the point. I think that he did use, you know, figures and different animals and, uh, you know, different storylines to create an imagination that, yeah, it's true that, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons would say, you know, the people that, you know, put that together, hey, check out the Narnia series. But that doesn't mean that uh, Lewis was endorsing the occult. Rather, we know that we can see that like Aslan is a Christ figure. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to be careful that we don't push his metaphors too hard because it's not written to teach, you know, just this black and white theology. So we have to remember he's a creative type trying to teach us truth, but it's clothed with creativity and color. Sometimes I get the sense that as we read C.S. Lewis, he's taking us on his own theological and philosophical journey with him. And so what we what we kind of maybe give up in perfect theological accuracy, we gain back in his creativity in the Narnia series and, and mm. you know, just the way that he speaks about things and the way that he tells stories. And, and so I, I, that's one of the things that I just love about Lewis. But there's are other things that maybe will concern some of our uh, you know viewers or listeners. And part of this came out of a conversation that happened happened in the comment section of our YouTube videos where you had a video saying, man, Lewis is, is, is awesome and you should check him out. It's a very quick paraphrase of your whole video. But uh, And some people were like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. What about all these other things? So we're going to discuss them. And one of them is that, you know, Lewis kind of asserts that there's people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. So comment on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and this is true and that's problematic. We can step back and we need to remember that you can eat the meat and spit out the bones. So if I'm encouraging people to read C.S. Lewis, that doesn't mean I'm saying you should believe everything that he writes. Uh, we should remain discerning. But the, some of the same people that would be critical of reading C.S. Lewis, are they going to be critical of reading Augustine? Uh, what about Augustine's allegorical approach to scripture? Is that going to bother people? Or what about John Calvin? Uh, some of the reformers who might really buck against the idea of reading Lewis. Uh, what about him, you know, calling for the death of the heretic, uh, Michael Cervantes? Or what about Martin Luther uh, in his uh, Tractatus, where he writes against the Jews? He had a hatred for the Jews. Uh, you know, he was a bully. Uh, he was, you know, problematic. You can picture Luther for many of the good things that came out of his life. Uh, he wasn't without air. So I'm just trying to make a point that when we're talking about some of these historical figures, uh, be it Ulrich Zingli, you know, allowing the Anabaptists to be drowned there, uh, you know, in the river in Switzerland, uh, in, in Geneva. And so I would say, or in Zurich, excuse me, I would say that that's a real 
that's that's a real uh, problem. We have to remember that everybody that's writing has issues. Uh, I've changed points on things, and even the person that like wants to write about you know don't ever read this person well why should we read you don't you have some error in you or are you the one that we need to pick up and read so it's kind of like the person who says oh you can't read lewis oh but we can read you like do you have the entire bible figured out do you have all of history figured out of course not i think that all of us got some heresy in us and i don't uh you know it it, what is heresy um you know, we, we need to get the gospel right. Uh, and I think that there's some problems as well, as we'll talk about with Lewis later in this. But I do think that people just need to calm down. Uh, they, they get so worked up sometimes. Like you can't, they're so either or, so black and white, so rigid. And I, I just want to say, okay, well, um, I, I wonder if the people that are that critical are that consistent about the music they listen to, about the Netflix series that they listen to, and about everything else in life. So, if they're going to pick on Lewis, then okay, pick on other things as well. But you can enjoy things just like I think you can enjoy music and you can enjoy Netflix. You just got to keep the discernment on. What a great reminder of the self-reflection that we need to do of our own entertainment and our own theology that we're reading and maybe not to throw stones too quickly. But but comment on uh, what maybe is underneath some of that comment, uh, a little bit of universalist or universalism type flavor that Lewis might have. What, what, what did he understand about, you know, how, you know, salvation came about or, you know, whether yeah. or not Christianity was inclusive? Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, Lewis dedicated uh, his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, to Bede uh, Griffiths, a former student of his who became a longtime friend. And Griffiths founded a Christian monastery in India. And he said that Hindu temples are a sacrament, saying no one can say in the proper sense that the Hindu, the Buddhist or the Muslim is an unbeliever. I would say rather that we have to recognize him as our brother in Christ. Now, what Bede Griffiths did and said is the logical conclusion of a statement that Lewis made in Mere Christianity, where he wrote, there are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion, which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. For example, a Buddhist of goodwill may be led to concentrate more and more on the Buddhist teaching about mercy and to leave in the background, though he might still say he believed, the Buddhist teaching on certain other points. Many of the good pagans long before Christ's birth may have been in this position. And so I think what becomes problematic here is Lewis seems to be saying that Muslims and Buddhists and other people, insofar as their belief is squared with Christianity, they too can be saved. And this is what is known as inclusivism. That is to say that those outside of the Christian tradition can be included in the benefits of the cross by means of applying uh, the similarities of their belief system to Christianity. And I think that is a problem. Uh, I would say that there's a few terms worth shaking out here. Uh, The universalist believes that everybody will be saved. There's going to be no hell. The annihilationist believes that people will go to hell, but like an ice cube that melts, uh, so too people will experience God's judgment, but their time will come to an ultimate end and they will cease to exist. Then there is the exclusivist, and we've talked about this before, where people can check out more on this, but there are is what I refer to as the hard exclusivist that says those who've never heard the gospel, uh, those in the 1040 window, the unreached people groups, uh, if they do not place their faith in Jesus, uh, they're going to go to hell. And we've said uh, that there's another view that I talk about, the soft exclusivist that says, yes, Jesus is the only way to heaven, but those that have never heard about him perhaps could be saved on account of what Christ did on the cross, even though they don't have that information piece. So think of the person who might be uh, in a place of believing there is one God whom is good, whom they've morally offended, and they say, I don't know your name, but I believe you made me and I'm asking you to forgive me. In the same way that God could apply the benefits of the cross to those under the old covenant, 
uh, outside of Israel. Similarly, he could apply the grace of the cross to the person who said that by faith. Now, Lewis goes a step further with inclusivism and says, hey, people can still hold on to being a Buddhist or hold on to being a Muslim. Uh, and, And I think that that is really problematic and we would want to step away from that viewpoint. Excellent explanation. So let's move to another, uh, you know, possible issue. Here's a quotation from a letter that he wrote describing a trip that he and his wife Joy took to Greece in 1960. He writes, I had some ado to prevent Joy and myself from relapsing into paganism at Attica. At Delphi, it was hard not to pray to Apollo the healer, but somehow one didn't feel that it would have been so wrong. So it seems clear that praying to Apollo would be praying to a false god. Bobby, what's going on here with Lewis's feelings about this dust up with paganism? Yeah, I mean, well, this is obviously sketchy, right? And it's a fair question. Perhaps his boyhood imagination swelled with renewed excitement as he's there in Athens. I mean, he spent so much time reading, uh, you know, the, the, the Greek poets and he understood all the mythology Uh, He would have been very familiar with Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, He would have been very familiar with Homer and Hesiod. And so all, all, all that had to be pretty overwhelming to him, you know, Mount Olympus and Zeus and uh, all that went down, uh, you know, in that, you know, world of fantasy. I think his imagination just probably got the best of him. Uh, I don't really know where his actual heart posture would have been. Uh, if he was truly tempted in that moment, um, you know, it doesn't seem like he caved into it. And so I call it a temptation uh, that he might have uh, dabbled with. But, it, you know, he certainly didn't pledge allegiance to Apollo. Uh, I just think he was probably moved in that moment. Uh, but, yeah, we should be leery. But I don't think, um, you know, you should not read him because of, of a statement like that. Because right. the truth is, is let's unpack every person's heart like the person that said i'm not going to read him because he did that well what about you what about your heart have you ever had a temptation i mean if we took every temptation that you ever had uh, and, and followed the way you're handling lewis then nobody would pay any attention to you either so this is where i think we just get a little bit rigid at times tim Very true. Well, one of the other comments that came out of the discussion on your uh, previous C.S. Lewis video was that Lewis is an evolutionist. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how you're going to answer this, but is that a problem for Christians to hold evolution? Personally, I don't um, see the Bible teaching, uh, you know, the theistic evolution. Uh, It seems like you have to create an entire backstory behind Adam and Eve And so it seems like you have to impose that belief. Uh, The Bible um, doesn't, you know, give us that explanation. And so I think sometimes that's the danger of being moved by science and not looking to the scripture. Uh, How old the universe is, uh, is an argument that people have. But the point of Genesis 1 and 2 is to teach us that God created us in his image to be good stewards of the universe. And then we argue around how he did that how long ago it was. But yes, Lewis did believe uh, in evolution. You know, he was a theistic evolutionist. Uh, I don't have a problem with God using small micro evolution, uh, you know, to bring about change. But in a micro way, I don't see room for macro evolution. But I wouldn't claim that a person is unsaved as some would for holding such a view. Uh, I just would see it not aligning to scripture. And that is something that, you know, if somebody's going to go to the place and say, you're just not saved. And if you believe in that, well, now do I have to believe, uh, you know, in, um, you you know, the fact that God created the universe in six to 10,000 years ago, do I have to hold to a young earth theory to be saved? So Mm. now are we adding to the cross? Uh, So I do think that there is some confusion for me. I just step back and go, I wasn't there. Uh, I don't mind looking, you know, at the evidence. But for me, I'm content to say God created us in his image to steward the universe and be gracious to those who have different opinions on this. But I do think it's dangerous to read the newspaper in one hand or modern day science in one hand and the Bible in the other and then try to do what's known as concordism, putting it both together. We should look at the scriptures first and foremost. And if something can square with scripture, great. 
And I think that Lewis and other theistic evolutionists would say they can make a biblical argument for theistic evolution. And so let them make their arguments. And if you disagree, fine, but let's get back to the cross. Do you believe Jesus died on a cross and rose for, from the grave for your sins? My problem, again, it's just very odd to me to picture, you know, Adam and Eve being the first couple that has the image of God stamped on mm. them, but there were other humans that didn't have the image of God existing before them. So I think that whatever view you take, you're going to have questions to answer. But I think that sometimes we're dividing over questions that we'll never know the answer to because we weren't there when it happened. Sometimes it feels like it's just a holdover from his atheism. I mean, again, he you know grew up in, in that kind of world and and understood some of that, and you know was uh, in the scholarly world for a long time. And so it might have just been an, a thing that he just didn't really feel like he had to look into. He could square those two things, and that was fine. But but you did mention something that was you know eminently more important than that. But did Lewis believe in purgatory? And if so, what does that tell us about his view of the atonement? Atonement, which is very important. Yeah, he did, Tim. Uh, he you know he he believed. In purgatory, he wasn't a theologian. In many ways, he wasn't a biblicist either. I mean, he struggled, uh, you know, with the story of Jonah. He struggled with the historicity um, in the Bible of the book of Job. Uh, Lewis was a philosopher. Uh, He was a great uh, literary scholar, a creative genius. But I think he missed the mark big time on the atonement. And this shows up, uh, you know, with purgatory, because what is purgatory? To purge. So you're having to go and have your sins purged. So in one way, he's considered the greatest apologist of the 20th century, but he wasn't a great theologian. And so I think if you're going to be a great apologist, you really want to get your theology down. And sometimes he leads uh, with his creativity. And this is just something for us to be aware of. And back, by the way, Tim, if I can add, uh, that's really being extracted from, you know, Second Maccabees, which is an apocryphal writing. And toward Mm -hmm. the end of his life, he was really leaning toward Catholicism. And so Mm -hmm. there is this sense where, you know, he was kind of a a high Anglican in his views. And so that did influence him. Uh, But that is apocryphal type language, uh, uh, believing in the, the, you know, this idea, uh, you know, of kind of a purgatory as well. Well, well, let's kind of maybe end on this question. Lewis talked about praying for the dead. What, what's up with that? Yeah. in his letters to Malcolm, C.S. Lewis makes mention of his instinct to pray for the dead. He says, of course I pray for the dead. The action is so spontaneous, so all but inevitable that only the most compulsive theological case against it would deter me. And I hardly know how the rest of my prayers would survive if those for the dead were forbidden. At our age, the majority of those we love best are dead. What sort of intercourse with God could I have if what I love best were unmentionable to him? So he obviously fails to grasp, once again, the benefits of the cross. Like, you know, praying for the dead. Why do we need to pray for the dead? The Bible tells us, you know, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment, right? This comes from Second Maccabees. Uh, it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loose from their sins in Second Maccabees 12, 46. But Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Think about the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Or what did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. If anyone deserved purgatory, it would have been the thief on the cross. So the cross settles it, right? Like when we believe in Jesus, his righteousness is applied to us because our sin was applied to him. It's the great transfer. And I think Lewis didn't understand how much he could appreciate about the atonement. And we need to be mindful of that when we're reading. Well, this has been a fantastic episode. From my perspective, I've learned a little bit. Any final parting words you want to leave our audience? Hey, I would just say, you know, read Lewis, enjoy Lewis, but be discerning, uh, you know, like you would with any other author. Don't assume that any one author perfectly represents what the Word of God says. We're all fallen and we're all doing the best we can uh, to interpret the Word of God. At least we hope so. (laughs) Well, if you need more reasons to dive into C.S. Lewis, check out the video on our channel where Bobby gives six minutes worth of reasons to pick up his material. We will meet you next time as we discover why Christianity still makes sense.